Right, welcome to our Zoom session here. I'm excited to um, invite our guest speaker today, Joseph Amato, to share with us a little bit about the RRF. And uh, one thing I one thing I love about having Joseph here is that we're able to get direct information from um, SBA because he works for SBA. He's the district director um, of uh, SBA. And we want to learn from direct source. Yesterday, we actually had a great session in Chinese with Martin Chan, who's a CPA in Philadelphia. And today we're going to hear, and Martin's on the line, also learning from Joseph Mata, right? So um, a little bit about Mar uh, Joseph. Um, I, I've known him for, I would say we've known each other exactly for one year now. Um, just, uh, you know, he's amazing, uh, very nice guy, you know, someone who's very helpful. You know, I, I reach out to him saying that, hey, what he has to share was really good. And he just opened his arms and wanted to share with everybody. And since then, we've been doing so many Zoom sessions. Um, Joseph was just telling me that this is his 187 or 78th Zoom. 57, 157. Oh, 157th Zoom sessions across the nation that he's been doing to educate people, whether it's the PPP program, whether it's the IDOL, whether it's the, um, uh, the RRF that we're gonna share with you right now. So let me bring him up and share with you guys and be prepared. Uh, I know it's a lot of information, but make sure if you have questions, save it for the very end because we're gonna do a lot of Q and A because you know, the more Q and A's we have, the better it is with um, us having a good understanding of how it works. So I'm gonna give the mic to Joe here. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a 907 in Las Vegas, where I'm actually sitting right now. Um, and I was telling Champagne, I'm exhausted because after I got the shot yesterday, I didn't sleep last night for some reason. And um, so I'm drinking a lot of water and hopefully getting through this by the weekend. Um, yes, this is my 157th webinar. And this one is going to be very important because uh, I come from the restaurant industry myself when I lived in New York. Um, so the restaurant industry is very close to my own heart. Um, most of my friends here in Las Vegas and in California are restaurant owners. So uh, I do all I can to help you. And this legislation should be very, very uh, helpful and important to most of your restaurants um, that you either are clients or that you own. Um, and we're hoping this being sort of the last stream of COVID uh, stimulus, that this will be the most important. Um, I'm going to go through a slide deck, um, so you don't have to look at me. You can look at the slides. At the end, uh, Chimping, I think you will let the slides be uh, available as well. I can't hear you, Chimping. Yes, you, you want okay, me to? Great. I got it for you. Okay. Okay. So uh, yes, I work for the Small Business Administration. Been with them for about four years. I've actually been involved with the SBA for about 25 years as a, both consultant and a banker. Um, so I do have a lot of experience with them, the good, the bad, the ugly. Um, they have done, they've gone from the smallest cabinet agency in uh, the presidential cabinet to one of the most powerful in this past year in, in basically providing in the neighborhood of about $2 trillion in stimulus money. Um, so this, this program we're gonna talk about today, the Restaurant Revitalization Fund or RRF um, is specifically for restaurants. Um, next slide, please. Um, it was basically enacted in March 11th. Um, it's got $28.6 billion currently appropriated for it. Um, there's a very good possibility from my conversations with both senators and congressmen, uh, congresspersons that uh, they will increase it if they see the demand far exceeds the 28.6 billion. Um, the program is gonna stay intact until the, all the appropriations are expended. So um, what we're hoping is that since uh, today is the day you're allowed to register for RF, and Monday is the day you're allowed to apply. Then once you get off of this um, and have the information in hand, you will quickly get your information um, together because you want to get your information together correctly. You do not want to go ahead and start registering because the minute you make a mistake, you're kicked out of the system. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit long uh, later. This is a very easy process comparatively um, Chimping said this morning she registered a couple of companies already. Um, it was a very easy process, um, but you want to be careful that all the information they're requesting you have correct because they will not allow you to make a mistake and then go back and fix it. Um, you have to put everything correctly from the beginning. So let's really, really be, um, be smart about it. 
if you get funding um, through this program, you're allowed to use the funds up to March 11, 2023. So it's almost two full years you can appropriate these funds. And when you see how this works, there's a very good possibility that the funds could be quite substantial and it may take that long to use them all. So we'll see, uh, we'll see as we go through this. Next slide, please. Okay, who's eligible? And this is really important. Um, you must serve food or drink to the general public. At least 33% of your revenue has to be to the general public. You cannot be a wholesaler that just basically sells to wholesale uh, other wholesale operations or a manufacturer that just sells the wholesale operation. You have to sell to the general public. And that includes almost everything having to do with food service, restaurants, food stands, food trucks, food carts, caterers, bars, saloons, lounges, taverns, snack and alcohol and beverage bars, including coffee shops and ice cream shops, bakeries, where at least 33% of the sales are on, um, on site and to the public, brew pubs, tasting room, tap rooms, same thing, 33%, breweries and or microbreweries, same thing, 33%, wineries and distilleries. You can't just be a winery that sells to distributors. You have to sell to the general public. Same thing, 33%. Inns um, and um, licensed facilities where or premises, alcohol, or beverage uh, producers where the public may taste, sample, or purchase products. So it's pretty all-inclusive. If you have food in your business, you are allowed to basically apply for this loan. Um, and one of the things people have asked us is caterers. Can caterers do this? Yes, if you're catering to the general public, even if you're chair, like here, there's caterers that work for the resorts. Well, they're working for the resorts, but they're not making food for the resorts. They're making food for people that are contracting the resorts. So that is still the general public. It's not someone that uh, you know, you're know you basically just selling to another corporation that does not go to the general public. Um, next slide, please. Okay, next slide. This is the most important thing you need to know. Um, each business can apply for funding up to $5 million. If you have multiple locations, which I've talked to a lot of people that have multiple locations, you cannot exceed 10 million total. So even if you have five locations and you get 5 million for one and you get 5 million for two, that's all you can get. You can only get up to 10 million uh, per application with affiliate businesses. And the way this worked, uh, we were talking to the SBA yesterday and we were talking to some businesses. Um, most of the time, separate restaurants have separate EIN numbers and that's the easiest way to apply. But to answer an early question, if you have like four locations and they're all under a separate EIN number, but they all started differently, and you'll see where the calculations come in differently, um, it gives you the ability to put in each individual location under the same EIN number. So that's a good thing. Minimum award is they don't want to award anybody under $1,000. So that's pretty simple. Next slide. Okay, so this is different than SVOG, which is the Shuttered Venues Opportunities Grant, um, which basically was um, a lot more in, intrusive and a lot more cried, a lot more information. Applicants for RRF do not need to register on SAM.gov. You don't need a Duns or a CAGE number. Um, you could have a valid unexpired I-10, and that's still acceptable. And your individual taxpayer identification number um, which is given by the IRS, that is obviously um, what we're using to basically differentiate the businesses, as well as, um, and there's some I-10 expiration FAQs. When we send this forward, you'll be able to open up that as well. Next slide. Okay, who is ineligible? Um, entities are ineligible for the following. Um, is a state or local government operated business? That makes sense. As of March 13th, 2020, owns or operates together with any affiliates more than 20 locations. So you can't be an owner of 25 McDonald franchises and apply for this. Um, you can be an owner of 19 McDonald franchises and apply for this, but you cannot do, um, you can't be more than 20 locations. Obviously they're trying to save money for the smaller businesses and keep out some of the bigger companies that have a lot of holdings. Um, if you have a pending application for the Shutter Venues Operate, uh, Opportunity Grant or Operators Grant, um, you cannot apply for RF. I would imagine most of the restaurants on this call are not part of the SVOJ. 
You can't be a publicly traded company or be owned by a publicly traded company. You can't be permanently closed. You can't be a nonprofit business. And um, you have to be at least asking for more than $1,000. Okay, pretty simple. Next slide. Okay, eligible applicants must be one of the following organizations and C Corp, S Corp, partnership, limited liability company, sole proprietor, self employed individuals. And there's some, um, you have to refer to your tax return to see self employed versus self sole proprietor distinction. Um, independent contractors, we talked about a little earlier. You could use your 1099K um, and you'll see why in a little while. Travel businesses are eligible. And LLCs, taxes, and S Corp or sole proprietor are all eligible. Next slide. Okay, who is eligible from a franchise standpoint? Any business concern operating as a franchise and meeting all other requirements is eligible. The franchise must be listed on the SBA franchise directory. That's pretty easy to go online and find out. If you do have a franchise restaurant and you want to apply um, and you're not in the franchise directory, uh, we're, you're going to have to contact the SBA. We're going to have to see whether or not, number one, can you apply under the, that guise of, of not being on franchise directory? And number two, is there enough money left at that point? Um, and um, again, it's uh, for those businesses, which most of them on here are probably not franchises, um, that's something you need to take into consideration. Next slide, please. Okay, so if you had a bankruptcy, Applicants that are operating under an approved plan of reorganization, either under 11, 12, or 13, and meet all the uh, program requirements are eligible for funding. So if times got really tough in the last year and you had to do a reorg of your business um, you, and you're still open, um, but you're reorganizing, you're, you're eligible for RRF. That, that could be a miracle for some of you. Hopefully there's no one on here that had to declare bankruptcy. An applicant is not eligible if they're permanently closed. So if you declare bankruptcy and you're permanently closed, you cannot, if you're permanently closed for any reason, you can't apply for RF. Um, if you file the chapter seven liquidation bankruptcy or you're not under an approved plan for seven, 11, 12, or 13. Okay, that's simple. Um, actually for seven, nope, go back, back, back. Um, under a seven, you're not eligible anyway. So I don't know why they said chapter seven under the last bullet point. Uh, permanently closed does not include businesses who would temporarily close their doors due to state or local restrictions or other pandemic causes, but are still in operation and have reopened. So if you've been closed to this point or you use this money to reopen, you can do that. Okay, very good. Next slide. All right. Um, how do other plans affect RRF? And this is really important. Uh, any funds already received from the Paycheck Protection Program have to be deducted from your RRF request. Now, listen to what I said, because I've had this conversation to the point where I was dizzy yesterday. If you've received PPP1, but did not receive PPP2, you've only received PPP1. So say your business did $3 million in 2019, did 500,000 in 2020, you're eligible for $2.5 million and say your PPP one was 250,000, you'll now be eligible for 2.25. If you did not receive PPP two, but you have an application in, two things are gonna happen. If you get awarded the RRF, the minute your bank calls you and says your PPP two has been uh, approved, just deny it. Just say, I got the RRF and just deny it. If for some reason your bank doesn't listen to you because they wanna collect fees, <laughs> And then basically, and they send you the PPP2 money and you already received an RRF, you need to take the PPP2 money and send it back to Treasury. You do not want to double dip. You don't want to be caught double dipping. You get caught double dipping. That's going to be probably not good news for you and your business. Okay. And hopefully everybody understands that. We can answer questions later on that. So again, if you receive the PPP1 and 2, you're going to deduct it. If you receive the PPP1, you're going to deduct the 1. If you have an application in for PPP2 and you receive the RRF and you can't stop the application process or you can't refuse the um, funding or your third alternative is to return the funding. Okay, next slide. Oh, and just the applicant can't have a pending application with SVOG and, and apply for RRF. We already knew that. All 
applicants must certify that current economic uncertainty makes the funding request necessary to support ongoing or anticipated operations. This is like the dumb comment of the presentation. Of course, every applicant has, can easily certify the current economic uncertainty makes them the funding request necessary. So it's an easy question, but it's a question they'll ask you in the application, okay? So just remember when it asks that, say yes. Stop jumping the gun, Jinping. <laughs> yes, thank you, Jinping. Next slide. Now, what can we use the money for? All right, business payroll, including sick leave, business utility payments, business maintenance expenses, business supplies, business food and beverage expenses, including raw material. Um, and in the food business, obviously that's, you know, celery, onions and everything else. Uh, covered supplier costs and business operating expenses, which basically covers everything. So you could basically use RF funds for everything to run your business. If you have business debt, you can make P&I payments on your mortgages and you can make P&I payments on your debt service. So if you already have a loan, you can basically pay off the payments. Now, somebody has asked me several times, can you make your idle payments using RRF money? Well, the funny thing is most people don't have idle payments yet because they've been extending it the time. So you won't have them yet. I have not gotten an answer yet to tell me that you couldn't. It is business debt. It is on the business. But my thought process is the idle is a really cheap loan. Why would you want to use RF money to pay off a 30 year amortization? So, um, and again, it does not include any prepayments of any debt. So you can't pay a year in advance on any business debt or you can't pay your mortgage a year in advance. Now the middle one's the most important. If you have to construct anything that's, that's has to do with you providing COVID services or COVID related services, outdoor seating. Um, maybe you had to do some construction internally in your restaurant to create barriers or plexiglass barriers or something, all that's eligible. What you can't do is you can't buy the space next door or rent the space next door and expand your restaurant. You can't, ex you have to use the footprint that you have what ex unless it's to expand outdoor seating but you can't expand your internal space. You can't go from a 2,500 square foot restaurant to a, and buy the space or rent the space next door and turn into a 5,000 square foot restaurant using this, these funds. Okay, next slide. When do I have to use the funds? And we alluded to this earlier. Um, the funds are going to be um, available probably within 14 days of you applying. Um, you must spend the funds between on expenses that were incurred or that are incurred between February 15, 2020. So you can pay deferred costs. You can pay accrued expenses. You can pay if you basically own your, owe your, um, one of your vendors or suppliers, say you, own, say you had $2 million RF and you own one of your suppliers, $125,000. And that expense occurred after February 15, 2020. Guess what? You can use this money to get yourself right and pay off all your vendors and suppliers on any expenses that incurred between February 15, 2020. And you can continue paying your business expenses up to March 11, 2023. So what happens if you permanently close um, between February 15, 2020 and March 11, 2023? Um, the covered period will end the day the business permanently closes. Pretty simple, okay? Any funds not spent on eligible expenses by the time the covered period ends must return it to the government. So say you get a million dollar RF and just for some reason you can't make it and you close the business on January 1st, 2022 and you still have a million dollars in your bank account. It doesn't make a lot of sense to close because you're gonna have to return that million dollars, okay? So any unused RF money, if you permanently close, has to be returned to the federal government. Make sure everybody understands that. You can't close the business and take the money and move to Tahiti. Okay. Also talking about how you're going to manage the use of the funds. After the total awarded funds have been exhausted, entities must provide a detailed expenditure report and certification for the required period. So again, 
every dollar you expend, you should have a detailed, um, whether it's an Excel spreadsheet or you work with your accountant and CPA to create some kind of dynamic uh, reconciliation of every dollar. But the federal government's going to ask you how you spent the money. So be prepared. You can't be going to buy a new Ferrari. You can't be spending it on a vacation home, you know, in Hawaii. You have to use the money for the business as we discussed earlier. Until the applicant completes the use of funds assessment beginning December 2021, applicants are required to provide a self-reported unaudited data detailing use of funds distributed for each year through 2023. So say you do get 2 million and say you use a half a million between now and the end of this year and you use another half a million between the beginning and end of 2022 and you use a million between, 2020, between the beginning and end of 2023. You're going to have to have a self-reported, unaudited, detailed reconciliation of how you use the funds. Now, they're saying self-reported and unaudited because not everybody can afford a CPA or an accountant to help them do this. Um, if you can afford it, you should do it because it just makes it that much easier. Um, but if you can't, just do it on an Excel spreadsheet. I know Cheng Ping Wu and her people can help you do that as well. Okay. The SBA will provide additional guidance that outlines what detailed reporting requirements mean and what the procedures will be in the coming weeks. This is the SBA way of saying we don't know how to, we're going to require you to report it yet, but we're going to come up with something. So I know that's being worked on now. Next slide, please. Okay, so how do you calculate it? I sort of gave you one quick review already, but let's go back to that review. You're gonna take your 2019 gross receipts minus your 2020 gross receipts minus your PPP loan amounts. That's the easiest way to calculate. So say your 2019 was 3 million, your 2020 was half a million, that's 2.5. And say you received PPP one for 250,000. You're going to get an RRF of $2.25 million. That's huge. I wanna see everybody smiling if that's something you think you're gonna get because that could save your business, that could save everything. And I'll go through all that stuff in a little bit, uh, Champagne, what you're writing on there now, okay? All right, next slide. So that's the easiest way to calculate it. Cal uh, next slide is, so okay, so applicants that began operations partially through 2019, so say the first calculation is you were in business the whole year 2019, so you started the business in 2015, whatever, 17, 18, if you started the business in 2019, you're going to take the average gross receipts. So say you're, you were in business for four months and made 1.2 million. Okay. You opened up in August or September. Okay. That'll be $400,000 a month times 12. That would be $4.8 million. So that would be your, your 2019 calculation. Then you then minus your 2020 calculation and say you lived in a state where your governor didn't allow you to open up your restaurant all year, okay? Just in 2020. So say that's what happened. So you're gonna have 4.8 million minus zero, okay? And you didn't get any PPP loans. You're gonna get a $4.8 million RRF. It's crazy, but it's good. Applicants that began operations partially in 2019 may choose to use Calculation two or calculation three. However, calculation three, which we're going to talk about now, could require a longer processing time. You don't want to use calculation three unless there's an absolute reason you need to, which we're going to talk about next. Next slide. So applicants that begin operations on or between January 2020 and March 10th, 2021. And the applicants have not yet opened, but have incurred eligible expenses as of March 11, 2021. And there are some crazy businesses out there that started between January 2020 and March 10, 2021. So what you have to figure out then is your total amount uh, of eligible expenses between February 15, 2020 and March 11, 2021, minus... 2020 and 2021 gross receipts minus your PPP. This gets really confusing, okay? And let's put it this way. I am taking everybody possible as they absolutely have to use calculation three not to use it. Applicants that began operations partially in 2019 may choose calculation two or three. However, like they said, there's so much more paperwork necessary for calculation three 
that they actually have to physically review everything. It's not going to be done by the computers at the SBA. All right. I know you're not, I hope nobody has questions on this because it's very confusing, but if you do, I will answer them a little bit later, okay? Next slide. Do not include in your 2020 calculations any of the following. First or second draw PPP, that is not gross revenue, okay? Any section 112 payments, SBA section 112 payments, that is when the SBA is making payments for you. Any idle loan, idle advance, targeted idle advance, or any other grant funds received through the CARE Act, that is not revenue. You want gross receipts for the business. This is all this other stuff are either loans or they're grants. They're not part of your revenue. And anything for the Rand Randolph Shepard Act, financial relief and restoration payments, which is called the FRRP appropriation. So none of those will be part of your 2020 gross receipts. Why 2020? Because that's when all this money came out. So if you basically had, as we go back to our original thing, if you had 3 million in, in, um, in uh, revenue in 2018, had 500,000 in 2020, but received say a million dollars in PPP idle and everything else, <coughs> you're not gonna put in 1.5. You're still gonna stay with the 500,000 in actual gross receipts. Next slide. So how do you apply? You're gonna go directly to the SBA platform at restaurants.sba.gov, which Champagne has already done this morning. Um, there's going to be point of sale vendors. SBA is actively looking for more partners um, with POS providers. Um, I do not know if they have any yet. But if you have questions, they supposedly have a, a scores and scores of people answering the telephone. Um, and that number is 844-279-8898. That is a hotline for the RRF. R, RRF. Um, some people that cannot or don't have the ability to do uh, online applications can actually do a telephonic application, but it's going to take a lot longer. So, because you have to fax things, you have to talk to somebody, and it could take a very long time. Hopefully, everybody has access to a computer. If not, Chimping will help you and put all your information in for you. <laughs> Okay, uh, what documents do I need? So this is really, really important. <coughs> Hold on one second, I'm sorry. I need this drink of water. Whew. Drink more water, thank you, Joe. Uh, first and foremost, you need to get the SBA form 3172. Chimping, you've already downloaded that, you have that. You can send it out to everybody if they need it. You have to complete it, initial it and sign it. Completion, completion of this digitally on the SBA grant platform will satisfy the requirement. You have to have also an IRS 4506T. You have to complete it, sign it, and if you do it on the SBA platform, that'll satisfy. Understand why we have to do a 4506T. We are taking you at your word that the numbers you're giving us for 2019 are truthful on your tax return and reflect what's on your tax return. Remember what I say that they're truthful and they reflect what's on your tax return. If you only have your 2019 tax return, that's all you're gonna put on the 4506T. If you have your 2019 and 2020 tax returns done, you're gonna put 2019 and 2020 on your 4506T. You have to be careful to, um, how do I wanna put this? To not provide misleading information because they're gonna check. So gross receipts documentation, how are you gonna prove what you made in 2019, 2020? Well, obviously the easiest way is tax returns. If you have a form 1120 or 1120S, if you have a form 1040 with the schedule C or the IRS form 1040 schedule F, that's all reflects gross revenue. For partnership, you're gonna usually have a 1065 or and including your K-1. Um, in some cases, if you don't have any of that for some reason, you're gonna need bank statements to prove what your revenue was and externally or internally prepared financial statements, um, such as income statements and P&Ls. You can, you can also use point of sale reports, like your, um, including your IRS 1099K. So all these can be used to legitimize what your gross receipts number are for 2019 and 2020. You should have these, they're very easy documents. If you own a business, there is absolutely no way um, that you shouldn't be able to provide this information accurately and truthfully. Next slide. So, okay, what's required for calculation one and two? Application form 3172, 
the 4506, the 2019 gross receipts tax return, three months of bank statements. Remember, you need three months of bank statements that is tied to your business account. Um, is it recent or not recent? We weren't told. I would always say provide three uh, months of bank statements because that's all they're asking for. Um, they haven't said recent. Your recent ones may be zero. Your, your 2019, obviously, I would pick like the your three of the months during 2019. Um, for 2020 gross receipts, you have to have at least one of these. You have to have a tax return filed, a point of sale report, that's preferred. They also will accept, but it will delay the process. Yes, 1099K is fine. Uh, internally or externally prepared financial statements such as income statements, profit and loss, signed data, and certified to the accuracy by the applicant. You may use that as well, but it's going to add time. And remember, time is your enemy because we don't want funds to run out where your application is in. Okay? Next slide. Okay, you see how crazy it gets with three. Okay? So you need 3172 form, you need 4506. You need three months of bank statement supporting account linkage validation. So as I said, you need to have a bank statement for your business account. You need 2020 and 2021 gross receipts, at least one for each. So 2020 tax returns filed or 2020 federal tax returns prepared, but not yet filed, okay? You're gonna have 2020 point of sale reports and 2021 point of sale reports. Those are gonna be preferred. Eligible expense documentation, at least one, and required appropriate supporting documentation for specific <coughs> eligible expense type. So preferred is to get a comfort level from your CPA, basically outlining that the expenses that you are allowing or identifying um, is, uh, is the expenses that are truthful, accurate, to the best of everybody's knowledge and ability. If the applicant submits expense related to the following categories, you need the appropriate documentation. Payroll documents, you want your 941s or your 940. Outdoor seating expenditures, you want invoices and or payments you've made. And business debt, you want the loan statements for the business debt, okay? What's accepted but delay 40, 14 days is again, you're going back to your externally or internally prepared financial statements. If the applicant submits expenses related following categories, um, payroll, outdoor seating, expenditures and, and business debt, um, tied to the financial statements, not tied to a tax return, then it may add some time as well. Hold on a second. Next slide, please. All right. What documents do I need in order to apply? Continue for. In addition to the documents in the prior slide, for applicants that are a brew pub, tasting room, tap room, brewery, winery, distillery, or bakery, you have to have documents that have a say evidence that on site sales to the public comprise at least 33% of gross receipts, which may include tax and trade bureau forms, state and local forms filed, or internally created reports from inventory management, sales reporting, or accounting software. For business that opened in 2020, the applicant's original business model should have contemplated at least 33% of gross receipts and on-site sales to the public. Okay? It's crazy. For applicants that are ins, whoop, 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 documents evidence, evidencing on-site sale of food and beverage, the public must at least 33%, and everything else I just said applies to ins as well. Next slide. Obviously, this, the SBA call center hotline is 844-279-8898. Local SBA district office, you go on sba.gov forward slash local dash assistance. You put in your um, zip code and it'll tell you where your local SBA office is. If they do not help you, reach out to Chen Ping. Chen Ping will reach out to me. And then you have the mighty crew of Chen Ping and her group. Um, and they will help you as well. And their numbers are on here and, and we're gonna be handing this out later. Okay, and more people. One more. <laughs> okay, so before you begin, please ensure that you will be authorized signer on the application and have the authority to act on behalf of the applicant. If, if you're not the owner, that you're it's CFO or you're the general manager or something like that, 
So you will have to be, you know, authorized to sign this. Uh, please ensure you have the following information before you start your business information, including owner, the owners and their tax identification information, 2019, 2020 tax returns. If they're done, hopefully 19 has to be done, should be done by now. And 2020 should be, if it's not done, you know what you have to provide as an alternative. Any relevant PPP loan information, including your SBA loan number and the amount. Bank account, including operating account information. And bank account, online credentials for securing linkage to the SBA. So you're gonna need your routing number, your account number, the name of your bank, and that's all on your checks, um, the easiest way to find them. You are now allowed to register, and this is what you get when you register successfully, right, Champagne? Yes. And it, it basically will then tell you on, on May 3rd, which is Monday at noon East Coast time, which is your time, nine o'clock our time, um, you're allowed to then ex uh, submit your application. Yep. So this is pretty much for general public um, calculation one. So one and two, here. you know, mostly one and two. And there's additional information you obviously need for three. So what's your best practices here? What should you be aware of? Com provide complete documentation. Applicants with incomplete documentation will be rejected. You can't make mistakes. You can't miss documentation. You do it, you're going to be rejected. And you're going to go back in the line because... Um, there, you, it doesn't save a space for you. So make sure you have all your information ready. Make sure you get help from the people that can help you uh, to make sure your information is correct. Uh, leverage your local resources. While not required, the use of CPAs and other accounting professionals may help ensure a complete and well-documented application. That's why I'm partnering with Champagne. That's what they do and they do a really good job of it. Application corrections. SBA is not able to make corrections on behalf of the applicant. The applicants who require connections, corrections will need to contact the call center hotline at 844-279-8898 to basically plead with someone from the hotline to help help you through this process. And applicants who still intend to apply for PPP, RRF applicants are advised to complete their PPP application in advance of RRF. Reason why you do that is you have a PPP in and you don't get RRF, you still get your PPP. If you get your RF, then you either have to decline or um, deny or return your PPP funds. Next slide. Okay, so when can I apply? There's a pilot period going on and all this is sort of nondescript at this point, the slide we could have gotten rid of um, because it, the application process or the registration process started today so everybody's gonna start registering after you have all the information you need and you can register through the weekend. On May 3rd, once you've registered and you've successfully registered, at noon on Monday, you'll be able to apply, okay? Next slide. Okay, um, why are there priority groups or what are the priority groups? If 51% of your business is owned by a woman veteran, socially or economically disadvantaged business, you will be the first priority to get funded. So women, veterans, socially and economic disadvantaged. Applicants must cert certify an application. They meet the eligibility requirements. So let me tell you something. If on your last tax returns, the husband was 51% and the wife was 49%, do not change it to your wife owning 51%. Whatever was reflected on your last tax return is what you should reflect on your application. And you'll find out soon if you self-certify differently and they see that, your application will automatically be rejected and you will not, not be able to apply. If you had someone that was not 51% prior to this application or on the last tax returns, um, you should not under any circumstance change the ownership interest to try to become one of the, one of the uh, priority groups. Everyone, I believe everyone will get access to funding over time. Um, they are definitely focused on women, veterans, socially and economic disadvantage. I'll explain what those are in a minute. So um, if an applicant, if an owner, this was an interesting situation. So say you have five owners and they each own 20% and two are veterans and one is uh, socially or economic disadvantage that would be 60%, you'd be able to apply as a priority group, okay? If you have five owners and two are veterans and everybody else isn't 
a woman, a uh, veteran, socially or economic disadvantaged, that's 40% ownership, you will not be a priority group. <clears throat> Do not change your priority group from what was reflected in your last tax return you sent to the IRS. Next slide. So what's socially disadvantaged? Um, are those who have been subjected to racial or ethnic prejudice or cultural bias because of their identity as a member of group without regard to their individual qualities. Individuals who are members of the following groups are presumed to be socially disadvantaged. Black Americans, Hispanic Americans, Native Americans, including Alaskan Natives and Native Hawaiians, Asian Pacific Americans, or subcontinent Asian Americans. I would imagine almost everyone on this call is a priority group. I would imagine. Okay, economically disadvantaged, which is an interesting and tricky one. Are those who are socially disadvantaged individuals whose ability to compete in the free enterprise system has been impaired due to a diminished capital and credit opportunities as compared to others in the same business area who are not socially disadvantaged? Well, this is an interesting one because I asked the question myself, um, does this include somebody um, that isn't socially disadvantaged, um, but they are definitely economically disadvantaged? The way this is written, it says they have to be socially disadvantaged as well. So we're trying to find out a little bit more. I don't think anybody in this group has to worry about this because I think everybody in this group is socially disadvantaged, but that's something we're looking into as well. <laughs> Why are you laughing, Jim Ping? <laughs> most, yes, most of our group here are. Yes, <laughs> most of our Asian Pacific Americans are subcontact in Asian Americans, right, okay. I imagine. Um, next slide. Okay, um, entity reorganization for the purpose of qualifying for the priority peer will, auto, will result in automatic disqualification. So you can't reorganize the company, as I just said several times, to qualify as, for the priority period. If you do that and it's not reflective of what's on your last tax return that went to the IRS, you're going to be completely disqualified and you will not be able to get an award. Next slide. Okay. Um, and there's also some funding set aside. There's five billion set aside for applicants with 2019 gross receipts of not more than 500,000. There's an additional four billion set aside for applicants with 2019 receipts between 500,000 and 1.5 million. An additional 500 million set aside for applicants with, with 2019 gross receipts, not more than 50,000. So they're really trying to focus on the smallest of small businesses. You can see here that 9.5 billion of the 28.6 billion is set aside for the smallest businesses. That's basically a third of the money, okay? SBA reserves the right to reallocate these funds at the discretion of the administrator. So if there's not enough uh, five, you know, to use up to 5 billion of gross receipts, not more than 500,000, then they'll reallocate it to the other bigger group, okay? Next slide. Okay, I talked about this before. If you need to find a resource partner, which is the SBA itself, the SBDCs, VBOC, which is the Veterans Business Outreach Center, the Women's Business Center, or SCORE, you can put in your zip code um, and that will tell you who is local to you that could be in a resource partner. And like I said, you also have groups like Chen Ping's group that can also help you directly. Next slide. I'm ready for the questions. <laughs> All right, let me pull up these. Um, let's pull up these questions. We have people raise their hand. One second. Thank you, Joe. A lot of information. I gained a lot. It's good. Let me pull up this. Okay. We have a lot of questions here. Is this a grant that I don't have to pay back? Yes, this is a grant. Awesome. Unless you do something illegal or your information is found to be uh, not correct, then the SBA and the federal government will go after the money you got. Will a vending machine business be eligible? Are you, s hmm, interesting, interesting, interesting. You're selling food or some kind of item to the general public, correct? That's correct. I think it's if it's a food product, beverage or food product, yes. Okay, good, good question, Tyrone. 
Um, the restaurant has been family opened and run for the past 21 years. Previously, the restaurant dates back to early 1990s. It was a bakery shop that turned into a coffee shop, a Mexican restaurant, and a Thai restaurant, and finally current, the longest, longest- Wait, 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 wait. Is the business operational? That's all I need to know. Yeah, I'm trying to read. To help Is better it? with service, what type of availability does this brand have to update? Um, honey, I, this is way too long. This is not a question. Can you ask? Uh, yes, the business is operational. Basically, the question is, can they use the money to renovate the kitchen? The business is open. It's both within the same square footage. It's fine, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't think that's a problem. If it's for normal business operations, I don't think it's a problem. Can I download As long as you're app? not building a new kitchen next door. So um, if you guys need to have the um, the PowerPoint, um, reach out to me. I can share with you my email and my phone number in a little bit. And then for WeChat, we will share that as well. So yes, we can share that. Um, can someone who can someone who own who has IT ITIN but not residency, not residency status apply for this? Um, are they here on a work visa? How are they here? Are they an investment visa? It really depends on why they're here. Okay, I have a question. So if there's someone who has an I-10, but they have no, they only have, they don't, they don't even have ID, can they apply? Can they use their Chinese passport to apply? That's I interesting. I-10 is not expired. Yeah, I, that's interesting. I don't know. I'm, the, I'm gonna write that down and try. Well, I'll tell yeah. you. <laughs> okay. Business open at 11, 2019. The tax return showing from date November 2019 to October 2020. Accountant did not file as calendar year. How is how how is it calculated? As oh, interesting because they filed fiscal year, which they shouldn't have done. Um, and basically what I think, hmm, I think you're gonna have to take your November and December finan um, financial statements, figure out what your average 2019 income would have been over the 12 month period, and then leverage that against the partial, the information you have for 2020. So you're, you're gonna have to have a p &L for November, December, to figure out what your average 2019 is uh, annualized. And then you're, gonna to, then you're gonna have to take your 2020 financial statements and annualize that and then compare the two. Uh, maybe we could just use the E-Tide. Um, it's used, it shows a gross receipt and then we just do 12 months average just with a cover letter will help too. Yeah, the CPA helping do that or, or yeah, the accounting professional helping them do that. Yeah, and you would have to use calculation too. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, okay. All right. So May says, thank you, Joe. Very clear message. Um, can you use RF to pay back rent, previous rent? Yeah, it's operational. Yes. Okay. And as long as it happened between those dates, the February or March 2020 and your 2000, March 2023. And that goes with uh, PPP as well or no? Because what goes with PPP? We're not talking about PPP. I know. I'm just asking because so people who have received PPP money, 40% can be used for rents, all of that. Can yeah, they yeah, 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 yeah. Pay free yeah, but remember, you're deducting PPP money from the RF or you're returning it if you get it after. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Is sushi catering business that is considered wholesale eligible? A sushi, if they're a caterer? and 33% or more of their product is sold to the general public, directly to the general public, then yes. If it's not, if they only provide catering to like um, a corporation or something like that, which I don't think that could be possible, then it wouldn't be. But yeah, I think as long as 33% or greater of their product is bought by the general, general public, yes. Wait, that is tricky because say example, if they are a catering company to ShopRite, but the general public is the one who's buying it. Yeah, I mean, they're still selling product that goes to the general public. They just have a distributor that's basically distributing it for them. I but still think it works. Five, right? Yeah. People um, assume sushi. 
Okay. Suzanne, um, the RF is a grant. There's no interest. Okay. No um, interest. Don't ask, you can't ask if there's interest. It's not a loan. Business opened in 2019, but only has 800 gross sales per my Schedule C 2019. I can't file my 2020 return. I have a local carryout. Can I be eligible? They only had $800 in gross sales on your Schedule C for 2019. You're, you're going to be under the $1,000 threshold. You can't apply. I think they may have just opened. Ira, can we... I think maybe they just opened. So they could use they could use calculation three and and get reimbursement for their expenses. Okay. If the business started on May 2020, can they apply for RRF? Again, we're answering the same question over and over. They can use calculation three and cover their expenses. And if they are incorporated before, that doesn't matter. If they have no revenue oh, in 2019, okay. right. it doesn't matter. That's right. That's right. Um, okay. Um, can the RF fund use to pay loan to owner? Owner has no, the no, money to no, it. no, 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 okay. no. Okay. Business expenses, that's called a, you're repaying an investment, no. Okay, and then do we have any hands raised? We have all the questions answered so far. Okay, more questions. Um, is 2020 income higher than 2019? Can I still apply? No. no. Common sense. I'm helping my restaurant to submit. Can I register once for myself, then add companies on portal, or do I need to register an account and account for each company? That I mean, think of your question. Of course, each company is going to have to have its own account. Well, Martin's a CPA. That's why she's. Okay. Yeah. Each, each. No. If you are doing it on behalf of a business, you have to apply for every company individually. You have to register each other company individually, and you have to apply for each company. Now, if it's a company owned by the common ownership, and they have several companies under common ownership, you still have to apply separately, especially if they have separate tax tax um, uh, tax forms. If they're all on one tax reform tax form then and you have four locations or whatever it is, then you basically would just file once. But there's a segment within the portal from what I understand that you can break down the individual companies. Okay, do we have any other questions here? I'm, I'm actually enjoying the guy cutting, what is he cutting, green onions? Celeries or scallions? I, I'm okay. actually going to. <laughs> yeah, that's a sushi restaurant in Oklahoma City. Oh, that, uh, yeah, he's the owner, so he, he can uh, he has a lot of uh, business this afternoon. So I'm hungry. He's making me hungry. <laughs> yes. OK, last question. One, almost one o'clock. We're doing really good on time here. Um, <laughs> business just opened April 2020 can apply, right? Yeah, they'll have to probably use a calculation three. Calculation three. Calculation <laughs> and get reimbursement for their expenses. Sounds good. Any other questions here, everybody? I think a lot of the answers are questions are answered. Oh yeah, uh, one question. So, um, so, so, say example, if it was a um, a deli where they have, as long as they qualify for thirty three percent, but how do we prove that it's for thirty percent of the thirty three percent of the sale was from the deli? Um, they basically outlined in the presentation certain documents that can be used to, to show that there's, there's um, outside sales. Um, if it's not, then they're going to have to get a letter from their CPA attesting that there's out, outside sales. Okay. Um, Ira Chase just sent one saying, if I follow my 2020 taxes, the income will be over 100000 but well, less than 1000 in 2019. If, if I mean, if you have more money in 2020 than 2019, you're not going to be eligible. No, I think his pro um, his issue was that he just started his business in 2019. That's why the revenue was so low, but 2020 was more. I think he needs it, to use three or... Yeah, he needs to use calculation three then. Yes. Yeah. If all else fails, calculation three will be used. Can you use RF to pay back SBA loan? I think... Well, right now, all the SBA loan payments are deferred. So I'm not sure oh, if um, 
if anybody's paying SBA payments right now, but um, it does say business debt. If it's a legitimate business debt, I, I don't see any reason why it can't be. It's from a whole different pool of money, but uh, I'm going to do a little research on that too. So earlier there was something about prepayments. So can we pay idle loan up or? No, that would be a prepayment. Yeah, that'd okay. be a prepayment. Okay. You can't do that. Okay, so you're saying that you could use the amount to pay for the monthly payments. Okay, got it. Cool. Yes, and Marin, we said this several times now. You can use the money during the covered period, which is, I think, um, February or March of 2020 to March of 2023. So if you owe your landlord rent and you get a $2 million RF, yes, you can pay your back rent because it incurred during the covered period. Sounds good. Well, this was a great group. Thank you so much, Tempeng. I'm glad we put this together. I'm going to go back to bed. Yes. Oh, can, can I ask a question? Yes, you may. Voice. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, my understanding is that this grant can be used also uh, to renovate, right? For instance, renovate the kitchen, to modernize the kitchen. Is that correct? You have to be careful, okay? Um, as long as you're not expanding the restaurant, I believe that it would be an eligible cost, but you can't expand the kitchen, but you could replace certain things that might have broken. Yeah, I think that's fine, but you can't expand the kitchen. You can't, you can't turn the kitchen from a thousand square foot kitchen to a 3000 square foot kitchen because you take over the space next door and then buy all new equipment to to outfit the new space. So if you have an existing space, I think that, yeah, I mean, it's a good capital investment. That's what we want to do. And if your fryer broke down during 2021, or if you're, you know, if, if you have a, an oven that needs to be replaced and you get a couple of million dollars or a couple of hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. I think as long as it's not the expansion of your business operation, then it should be fine. Oh, okay. Okay. I think that's what uh, we want to know. It's not expanding the kitchen. It's just uh, buying a new uh, oven, new stove, you know, because yeah, this has been sense. a very old. Suzanne, I already answered this question. You cannot use the money to pay back the owner, uh, a loan from the owner or anything. If the owner put in money during 2020, 2021 to shore up the business, you're not supposed, and there is not a, it's not an institutional loan. Um, you can make payments on certain things, but you cannot prepay or pay off. Remember, you can't prepay anything. So if the owner put $100,000 in the business and he has a, a, an executed loan with the company for business debt, then I think he could pay the P&I payments on that debt, but he can't pay off. That's called prepayment. You can't pay okay. off money that the owner put in. Okay, Suzanne? Okay. Okay. okay, so I'm going, thank you. To, I'm going to end our session here. I just want to thank everybody for hopping on. Uh, thank you, Joseph, for hopping on. Um, you know, always so considerate. I was asking for his time and he made time for us today just so we could share with you before the application starts because he understands we're on a race for applications to be approved. So, um, you know, I really want to uh, thank you and appreciate you for spending this quality time with us. And many of you guys who are who came on to learn, please share this information with your friends and your family who are in business and need, because you know everybody should be whoever is qualified should definitely be going for the money, and why not? Because it's definitely going to be helping your business, right? So um, thank you for hopping on, everybody. Joe, you want to say anything? Yeah, um, two things. Number one, I plan to be out to visit Champagne sometime before the end of this year, and I'm going to visit as many of your restaurants as I can. Um, because that's what I do. Um, I love to eat and I love to eat great food. So number two, you know, please take your time, register today, but make sure you've got all the information that it says on these slides. Simping is going to share these slides with you. Make sure you read through them again. Make sure you have all the information that you need up front. Please do not, do, don't, don't screw with this. I don't want to see anybody crying in their soup because they screwed up, they put in the wrong information and all of a sudden they're disqualified. I wanna see everyone on this call get the maximum amount of dollars that they're, they're allowed to get because I wanna see you all survive. I'm gonna come visit you sometime before the end of this year. 
and I'm going to eat a lot of good food and get fat. So, yeah, well, that's impossible. I'm, food. I'm sure there's a lot of restaurants who have benefited from, benefited from you and they want to treat you out. Um, uh, so here, yes. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, whether I'm in Nevada, California, every state I go into, I go visit restaurants that we've helped. And uh, they're just it's always a great feeling to see a restaurant owner survive because of what we are able to do with these stimulus programs. It's really yeah. great. And for anyone who wanted the slides, um, you know, you guys already have WeChat. Uh, we, we will be sharing on WeChat the PowerPoints. And then in terms of, um, you know, if you guys want the slides and not on WeChat, uh, feel free to add my email or email me your email. So that way, um, you know, notifying me that you are you want a copy of this PowerPoint so I can email it back to you. And if you have questions, you know, feel free to call my phone number or text me. So, you know, let me know and I will be able to help you. I'm not going to be anyone who asked me to email anybody. Please uh, use my email to email. I'm not, this is too much for me to go after on Zoom. Uh, thank you for everybody for understanding. So email me if you want this PowerPoint. And if you need to call or contact us for any questions, let us know. We'll be here for you. Thank you very much. So have a great weekend, everybody. Joe, take care. Drink a lot of water. Take some Tylenol. Enjoy the wonderful day. Thank, Thank you. you Joe. Have a great weekend. Take care. Take care. Take care, Joe. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. And anyone who's thank in you. Indonesia, thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Anyone who's Indonesian, contact Ibohani. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Thanks, right, everybody. I'm gonna end the meeting now. Okay. Bye. Good champagne. Bye bye. Bye. <laughs>